Would you join me in prayer? May the words of my mouth and the meditations of each one of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our salvation. Amen. In Genesis 12, Abram is simply minding his own business when God comes and calls him to get up and to go. On this day in history, God reaches out to offer a deal to all of humankind through Abram. God promises four things to Abram. First, he will give birth to a great nation, which, by the way, is what his name means, father of many. Second, he will be blessed. Third, his name will be great. And finally, his name will be a blessing to others. For good measure, God vows to bless those who bless Abram and curse those who curse him. All Abram has to do is follow God. In this call of Abram, the God of Abraham issues a summons to all the world that people would be devoted to God instead of themselves and things would improve. In essence, God chooses this man and throws an olive branch to all the generations. God is saying, if you worship me, if you put your life in my hands, you'll be rewarded. If you resist other gods, if you risk just being happy, I will reward you. Abram accepts God's call and he goes, not knowing where he is going, rather completely trusting in God. He goes, he goes and he submits himself to God. And he does this through what Abram does best. He walks, he's a good walker. He sets off walking, but this time he's walking with God. By walking forward in the footsteps of God, Abram demonstrates something very important for all of us to follow. He leaves footprints for us to follow. Most significantly, we need to remember that Abram does not believe in God, he believes God. And that's a distinction. He's not just saying, yes, I believe in God. This is the first encounter we've had. And he says yes to God's call. He doesn't ask for proof. He is the proof. He is following God. And therefore, Abram proves that God exists just by getting up and going. As the first man in the 20th generation of humankind, Abram is not spoken of as righteous. We just heard the reading from Romans 4 where the Apostle Paul, several thousand years later, calls him righteous. But not anywhere in the text of Genesis do we see this. He's not particularly special. By the time we meet him, he's 75 years old. He often seems unsure of himself. He makes mistakes. He forgets things. In the text, which is completely focused on creation, Abraham and Sarah, or Abram and Sarai when we meet them, don't have any children. They're not able to create. Their story is dominated by childlessness. It is almost as if he is so unlike God the Creator that this is what makes him special. He is completely and utterly human. And as such, he is completely in need of God. While many in humanity, especially in our generation, strive to follow the market God, and become more godlike themselves, powerful, more in control. And in so doing, they show us what Abram didn't possess. And what Abram didn't possess was that need to go that way. They lack their humanness by going after godness. Nellie Sachs, the German poet who became the Nobel Prize winner for literature in 1966, viewed Abram as a representative of all human beings. She saw him as one who looked out at the decimated landscape, peering beyond the flames, aching for just a piece of what was divine. She wrote, you have called me Abram, and I long so for you. And that's it, the longing. By the 20th generation of humankind, God certainly needs one such as this, somebody who is so human that they need the divine. As much as we are like Abram, we're so human, 
and yet needing the divine, we also will find our rest and peace in God as he did. Because of Abraham, between this moment and next Sunday morning, more than three billion people on this planet will pray in one voice. And in that voice, they will pray to one God and those, the children of Abraham, Jews and Christians and Muslims together will invoke his name as the father of their faith. And it all begins in verse one of chapter 12. Our lesson in forgiveness from Abram comes in the form of trust. So often we fail to forgive because we don't trust. We don't trust God. We don't trust the outcome of our forgiveness. We fail to forgive because we are not sure that if we give in to forgiveness, we'll still be in control. We want to stay in control, and forgiving and being forgiven means to give control to God. To let go means to give the power to God, when all along we thought we had the power. We start asking, what if I ask for forgiveness and this happens, or what if that happens, or what if she says this, or what if he answers this way? We get all wrapped up in ourselves. What if I pour my heart out to Sally and Sam won't forgive me either? What if, what if, what if they don't accept my forgiveness? Abraham calls us, as God calls us, to move, to move. That's the most powerful thing that happens in this story. He moves. Inertia never produces forgiveness. I'm going to repeat that. Inertia never produces forgiveness. It can't. Movement and action produce forgiveness. Abraham teaches us how to trust and how to move and how to simply, in the words of 12-step programs, let God, let go, and let God. It is not easy to follow God's promise to take risks and to resist the powerful in this world in which we live. If we don't believe this, we should look more closely at the next reading from John 3. Here we are presented with a refreshing story about the presence of God in Jesus Christ. A man named Nicodemus, who's a leader among all of the Jews, steps out of his comfort zone, out of his house of privilege. He seeks Jesus, not in the daylight, too risky, but under the cover of night. He needs to figure out who Jesus is and who he is in relation to Jesus. What is Jesus teaching? What does he have that Nicodemus longs to have? In, in the exchange between the two men, which is very powerful, we come to realize that Jesus has everything Nicodemus is missing. He has peace with God. He has the spirit of God within him. He has the keys, if you will, to the kingdom of God, and he has the promise of eternal life. In the end, Jesus shares with us and with Nicodemus the truth of the gospel in one verse, as Martin Luther calls it. Listen to these words in the language given by Eugene Peterson. This is how much God loved the world. He gave his son, his one and only son, and this is why so that no one need be destroyed. Listen to that. So that no one need be destroyed. By believing in him, anyone can have a whole and lasting life. Simply put, to Nicodemus and to each of us, God loves us. God loves us. God loves you. God loves me so much that God would give God's only son, the one and only, for each of us. Christ came into the world. And I might remind us, Christ didn't come into the First Congregational Church or Broad Street Presbyterian, or any church on the avenue, right? Christ didn't come into Columbus. Christ didn't come into America. Christ came into the entire world, not to destroy the world, but to offer the world hope and the wholeness and lasting life. Somewhere between the beginning of each of our lives and this point, we may have lost track of what an amazing gift we have in the love of God for us through our Savior, Jesus Christ. Somewhere we may have lost that. It is always good and fruitful for our lives of love 
and forgiveness to be reminded of this passage. It is always good to remember and celebrate the truth that God is not in the business of condemning us, or the rest of the world for that matter. While others may want to play God and may want to manipulate the words of God for judgment and not grace, God isn't in that business. God is in the love business. God is in the saving business. God is in the redemption business. God is in the forgiving business for each of us, for everyone. But what does God's loving and saving business look like exactly? John 3, 14 and 15 tells us that life in God's love through Christ is both uplifting and it's eternal. Like Moses' serpent in the wilderness, Jesus is lifted up both on the cross and in the ascension into glory. And in this lifting, belief in God's sacrifice and glory are given new shape and given new hope in eternal life. Uplifting and eternal. These are the central elements of God's saving love. I have seen the uplifting and the eternal nature of God's love so often manifest in you, manifest through suffering and pain that you have gone through, manifest in ways that people share with one another in tumultuous and difficult times. While I sometimes wish I could wave a magic wand as a pastor and see all pain go away, all pain disappear, I'm aware that I can't and that the immensity of love would be diminished, even unrecognizable without that. To suffer in love for the one whom you love in the midst of their suffering is to live life to its holiest. We actually come to see eternal life in the face of such suffering. We see grace twisted in pain, but embraced by love. We see a peace which passes human understanding growing from the depth of the suffering. Years ago, in the Toledo Museum of Art, a painting entitled The Deposition, which for those in the law think, well, where's he going with a deposition here? <laughs> this is a different deposition, showed the scene at the foot of the cross following the death of Jesus. His body is off the cross. It's on the earth below. As the dead body of Jesus lies at the foot of the cross, John, the beloved disciple, author of the gospel we've just heard from, is beside him, and John is washing his body of its blood. Jesus' mother, Mary, is looking on. She's close at hand. Her face is twisted in pain. Her body is turned halfway towards her son, who is dead before her on the ground, and halfway away from it. You know that feeling, that feeling you've had when you face such horridness in death and loss that you're turned toward it because you want to honor one last time the one you love, but you can't stand being there either. You're torn like Mary is in this scene. And in the distance, several people are there, including the shadowy feature of, Jesus, of Peter who has denied and abandoned Jesus in his time of crucifying death. For those who have stood by the cross, those who have stood by him in his suffering, there is intense pain, but that pain is holy pain. For those who have tortured him or betrayed him or abandoned him, the pain is different. It is the pain of unholy guilt. It is what we do in the face of the cross and at the foot of the cross which matters most. If we are to experience God's uplifting and eternal love, we must go there. We have to abide there. We have to work through the pain there. The one who teaches us about the saving love of God, the ones who teach us about the saving love of God are the ones in our lives who show up in our suffering as we have showed up in theirs, and they love us in the midst of it. Stephen Shoemaker tells the story of a woman like this in his book, God's Stories. Jean Stout was a Kentucky woman who'd been disabled all her life. She was physically disfigured and struggled with so many physical issues. As a young woman and a Baptist growing up, she was too embarrassed to come forward for baptism when her name was called. She didn't want anybody to see her this way. So this is late in life that Stephen meets her in a nursing home by her bedside. 
and he baptizes her there. And when she looks up from him so close to death, Jean smiles and says to Stephen, the only thing that is helping me in my pain is liquid, but it's liquid morphine. This may sound silly to you, Pastor, but that morphine is the most beautiful color of blue I've ever seen until the water of baptism. Her improbable praise brings Stephen to tears. And then she finishes with these words just as she's dying. God, you've been in my actions. You've guided my life. You've walked with me through all I have encountered. Now be with me in my dying. Lift me and carry me into your arms, into the heavenly dwelling place you call home. I can no longer care for my family, Lord, and that's something I hate worst of all. So I leave them in your hands, you who will send them angels of mercy and love. Help them accept your presence in their lives, whoever you choose to make your love manifest. And with those words, she dies. I've heard such words like Jean's at bedsides, some of the bedsides of your beloved ones. When such words as this come into our hearts and minds, a healing happens. It is a healing deeper than the body, which is destined for death, a healing that is final union with God. From such as these, I have learned not only how to die, but how to live. I have learned how to offer my passion to God as well as my in well-intentioned actions. At the heart of today's gospel is one word, you heard it a few weeks ago. It's simply love. It's God's love. This verse tells us that the initiative in all salvation is the love of God at the heart of God. Listen to this verse, unpacked by phrases. Listen to it in its powerful message. God so loved. God so loved the world. God so loved the world that he gave. God so loved the world that he gave his only son. God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whosoever believes in him. God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Mother Teresa said of this passage some years ago, the good news is that God still loves the world through you. You are God's good news. You are God's love in action. Each time anyone comes in contact with us, they must become different and better people because they have met us. Each of us must radiate God's love. God still loves the world, and by many accounts, it's not a world that's easy to love. I think we can all agree on that. It's not easy. Hey, we're not easy to love. <laughs> Terror and war, hunger and oppression, all of those things, the injustice of this world, the violence that we face, man's inhumanity to man makes this world hard to love. But in spite of that, maybe because of that, God has love in the face of a world that sometimes hates God or battles with God. Nevertheless, God continues to love the world. God loves the unlovely and the unlovable. God loves those who are really down and those who are really up. God loves the lonely that have no one else to love them. God loves the man who never thinks of God, and God loves the woman who lives in God's presence constantly. God loves the graceless and the graceful. God loves the one who has never given a thought to God and knows how to lift a prayer and the one who seeks God in prayer every day. God loves the one who is angry at God and others around them and the one who is content with God and others around them. God loves the one who spits at God and God loves the one who smiles at God. God loves you and God loves me. As St. Augustine has written, God loves each of us as if there were only one of us to love. Because God loves us so much, I ask each of us 
to experience this renewal of the Spirit, to figure out how this leads us to forgiving love, to be born again in that love and forgiveness, to embrace the promise that God made to Abraham and fulfilled in Jesus. May we get up and follow God, our God who gave us Jesus, as a sign of the intensity and the seriousness and the fullness of his love for us. Forgiveness will rule our hearts when we embrace such a wondrous love as this. Amen.